Hey everybody, welcome back to the Financial Freedom Show. My name is Rob Berger. I'm really excited about this video. I'm gonna do something uh, different um, and something I plan to do going forward. And it came about because uh, a viewer emailed me, or actually it was a, a comment to a video, and he asked me to evaluate his, his investment portfolio. He actually listed the tickers, uh, in this case, as you'll see in a minute, all ETFs, and the percentages uh, that he owns in each ticker. He wanted my thoughts on his portfolio. So that's what I'm going to do today. I'm going to show you his portfolio and evaluate it. Uh, I'm calling it the Rate My Portfolio series. I'm going to create a playlist in YouTube. So as I add additional uh, videos going forward, I'll add them all to the same playlist. You can check them out. So if you want me to rate your portfolio, all you have to do is leave a comment to this video. And I'm going to need a couple of things. I'm going to need the ticker. Uh, and that can be an ETF, mutual fund, even individual stocks. Happy to give you my opinion on individual stock portfolios and the percentage you own of each. And I'd also like to know uh, the type of, uh, of account, just is it retirement or non-retirement? Now, I, a couple of things. One is I'm going to assume long-term investing. Uh, you know, if you've got an investment portfolio and you plan to sell it in a year, <laughs> that's fine, but I'm not, I can't evaluate a portfolio over the course of a year. If you're a day trader, well, good luck and Godspeed. I don't really have much to add to, to, to day trading. So this is going to be all long-term investment portfolios. The other thing I want to mention is I'm not your financial advisor. You're not paying me for this. I don't do phone calls. I don't do one-on-one -on -one sessions. This is all via YouTube videos. And what I'm doing is giving you my opinion. You want my opinion of, on your portfolio? I'm happy to give it to you, but I'm not a financial advisor. So if you want professional financial advice, you need to hire uh, a certified financial planner, chartered financial analyst. Uh, you could uh, go to an investment advisory firm and get paid advice geared specifically to your circumstances. That's not what I'm doing. I'm happy to give you my opinion about a portfolio. And uh, the way I think about it is, if this was my portfolio, what would I do? Would I be happy with it? Would I stick with it? Would I change it? So that's the deal. Uh, happy to look at uh, other portfolios in the future. But now let's turn to the portfolio on at, at hand. It was um, sent to me, again, as a, through a comment. Uh, the gentleman's name, if I'm pronouncing it right, is Isik. And I'm sorry if I've totally mispronounced that. So first, Let's take a look at the portfolio. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna be using two tools today. One is called Stock Rover. It's a new tool. It's, it's in some ways, I guess, kind of like Morningstar, uh, but uh, it has a lot of different features to it. It's got a gazillion features. I'm only gonna be looking at a couple of things and then gonna be spending some time uh, on personal capital. Those are the two tools I'm going to use to evaluate the portfolios. So let's go to the screen. And um, I'll explain some of this as we go. Ignore the chart for a moment. I just want to look at uh, the funds in his portfolio. And they're over here. You can see there's several of them. And we'll just go through them one by one very quickly. The first one, BND, it's Vanguard's Total Bond Market ETF. We actually looked at this in the last uh, uh, video, or certainly on the three fund portfolio. It's a very uh, uh, sort of highly regarded uh, fund. It's an easy way to get exposure to uh, the bond market. And so there's the fund. He has 10% uh, of his portfolio uh, is in BND. And then the next fund is SCHD. That's Schwab U.S. Dividend Equity uh, ETF. And it is a large cap value fund. Value meaning it invests in stocks that are uh, considered undervalued based on any number of metrics. Uh, for example, price to earnings or price to book would be uh, some examples. Uh, you can contrast value uh, investments with growth. So growth are the high flyers. They're going. They, they're growing their revenue. They're growing their earnings uh, greater than than sort of average. Um, here you could think of Tesla or Amazon. In contrast, value would be those companies that you grew up with as, with, as, as kids, you know, the, the, um, the, the, the Home Depots of the world, the, 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 the stocks that have been around for a long time, typically. Um, banks are a good example of value stocks today. So that's SCHD. And then he has VNQ, and that's just Vanguard's uh, real estate uh, index fund. It's a REIT. And actually, uh, let me go back up to SCHD for just a minute. You'll notice in the gray box, if you look at the bottom right, that's the dividend yield, 2.8%. Uh, 
If you look at the bottom left, there's something called beta, and it says beta one year, and it's 0 0.92. Beta is a very helpful uh, data point when evaluating a mutual fund or an ETF. And the idea here is beta will compare an ETF, in this case, to a benchmark. Now, for stock ETFs and mutual funds, they typically use the S&P 500. So the S&P 500 would have a beta of one. That's sort of the market. And then if, if an investment has a beta greater than one, it means uh, that it's riskier, that is, it's more volatile. And the way you can interpret it is imagine an investment with a beta of one and a half. That would mean that if the S&P 500 went up 10%, an investment with a beta of 1.5 would go up 15%. And if the S&P 500 went down 10%, uh, an investment with a beta of 1.5 would go down by 15%. So uh, beta kind of tells us two things. It tells us how highly correlated uh, an investment is to the S&P 500. Does it move in lockstep with the S&P 500 or, or not? And also directionally, it, it, or, or, or the uh, not just directionally, but how much more or it, it will gain or lose as the S&P 500 goes up or down. So all of that said, with a beta of 0.92, it means it's a little less volatile. Uh, it's not going to go up or down quite as much, uh, but it's still pretty close. It's not a, it's not a huge uh, uh, deviation from the S&P 500 at, at 0.92. Now, the one thing I'll stress is this beta is over the last one year. As you can see, beta one year, you could look at beta over a longer period of time and have a different number, right? All right, so that's beta, and it can be a helpful statistic or data point uh, when you're evaluating uh, investments for your portfolio. So when we go down to VNQ, which is the REIT, uh, you'll notice the beta is 0.96. I mean, it's almost, <laughs> one could argue, at least based on this data point, this beta one year, it, it, it adds very little to an S&P 500 index fund uh, because it moves almost in lockstep. With the, with the S&P 500. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean you shouldn't have a REIT fund. I have a REIT fund in my portfolio, but it's, 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 a, it's a notable uh, point that it's highly correlated to the S&P 500. A VTI, is, of course, is the Vanguard Total Stock Market uh, Index Fund. You'll notice its beta is 1.03, um, and that kind of makes sense. It's, um, as we looked at when we compared VOO to VTI in the last video, uh, it moves very closely with the S&P 500. And then his last fund, VXUS, is a Vanguard Total International uh, Stock ETF. Uh, you can see, by the way, its beta is 0.83. So this actually gives you a fair, fairer amount of diversity to the portfolio than um, uh, some of the other funds we've looked at. So that's his portfolio. Now, let me pull up very briefly uh, how he's allocated it. And I can do that here. Let me show you this uh, shot. So this is still in Stock Rover, and I've got his, his funds here. And um, the starting value you can ignore. I'm looking at a 10-year period. That's why the starting value is low. It's, I, I created his portfolio assuming a million dollars. You can see it's actually a little higher than that because I partly because of rounding and partly because I created the portfolio a day or two ago. Um, and uh, you can see how he's allocated. There's his roughly 10% in the bond fund, roughly 15% in the Schwab uh, U.S. Dividend Equity Fund, uh, another roughly 10% in the REIT, 50% uh, in VTI, and then 15% uh, in the International Fund. That's his uh, allocation. One kind of interesting thing before I compare this is with Stock Rover, you can look at future income. So this is the future uh, projected income of his asset allocation, assuming a $1 million portfolio. This is effectively the dividends and interest that that portfolio will generate by month, as you can see here, and then it totals it by year, end of 2021, 20, uh, and then the end of 2022. I actually find this to be a useful chart when I'm evaluating my own portfolio and sort of planning uh, uh, for the next year, year and a half. You can look at this, by the way, at the portfolio level. Um, that can be useful 
if you have multiple portfolios, multiple investment accounts that you've added to stock over, and then we can obviously break it down at the holding detail. Um, so you can see here the tickers and what uh, income they'll generate and when. All right, so now going back to uh, the portfolios, what I did was I created a three fund portfolio with the same stock bond allocation. His stock bond allocation is 90-10. And let me just stress this, when you're evaluating a portfolio, the first and most important thing is the stock bond allocation. And uh, it's critical. Now, he's at 90-10 for a long-term investor. I think certainly that's a reasonable approach. I don't think it's the only right approach. I kind of view uh, this uh, Rate My Portfolio series, it's kind of pass-fail in a way. Does the portfolio pass or fail? And for a long-term investor, I certainly think 90-10 is, is uh, a great allocation. I think 80-20 would be reasonable, 70-30 would be reasonable. I think if you were you know, 10% bonds and 90% stocks, in most cases for long-term investors, probably not the best allocation. I suppose if you had so much money, it didn't matter, maybe, but for most of us, probably not a good choice. But in this case, 90-10 is, I think, perfectly reasonable. And so I created the same portfolio, uh, the same stock bond allocation with a three fund portfolio. That's uh, uh, VTI, BND, and VXUS. And you can see they move in lockstep. They're pretty close. Uh, this goes back to 2007. And you can see his portfolio slightly outperforms the three fund portfolio. Now, there's a caveat here. The SCHD fund, this uh, Schwab fund, actually didn't get started until 2011, I think, or 2012. So I'm not quite sure how Stock Rover does the back testing on that. Um, that's something I'm going to look into. But um, if we go back as far as Stock Rover goes, um, they're almost identical. I would say that. Isaac's portfolio is maybe slightly more volatile. If you if you look like, for example, in the depths of the financial crisis a little over a decade ago, his uh, portfolio lost what thirty seven, maybe maybe if I if I move the cursor a little bit, thirty eight percent versus a three fund portfolio lost thirty seven thirty uh, two percent, uh, but performance about the same. His slightly outperforms. If we switch to a five year period then the three fund portfolio actually slightly outperforms. Um, but this is, um, I think, a, a useful comparison because one thing to consider in a portfolio is how easy it is to maintain. Now, in his portfolio, I think it's reasonably easy to maintain. It's only, what, five, five funds. That's not that many. Uh, of course, you know, the question is, does it, is there a reason to go beyond a three fund portfolio? And as I've invested more and more and longer, it's been over 30 years, even though I have a six fund portfolio. So plus I have individual stocks. So, But that being said, there are many days when I think, yeah, probably a three fund portfolio is all anyone needs. Uh, and I think that's probably true in looking at his portfolio. It's not that what he's done is, is, is bad. I don't think it is at all. Uh, but one question is, could a three fund portfolio achieve the same objectives? All right. So having said all of that, I now want to look at his portfolio uh, in personal capital. And um, this is a, a sort of a demo account that I set up. Um, and it's got a couple of things in here. We've in past videos, if you've seen it, this is my actual, I've actually connected my M1 finance account. This is my credit card rewards that I invest every month. It's up to 24,600 bucks. This is a three fund portfolio that I just created as a demo. Um, and then what I did was I also then created his portfolio. Here it is. You can see I, I tried to get as close to a million dollars as I could in terms of the value. I created it a, day, a couple of days ago, I think. And uh, so here are his funds. And we can use personal capital uh, to take a look at, again, uh, the asset allocation in some detail. And we can also look at the fees because that's very important to understand what the fees are of the portfolio. So let's start with the asset allocation. Now, when you go, if you're using personal capital, I think it's it's probably, if I only could use one tool, this would no, no doubt be what I would use. You'll notice when I go to asset allocation, it pulls in all of the investment accounts. So my M1 finance account, this manual investment account I just created, his account, 
and I don't want to do that. I just want to look at his. Well, the nice thing is, is this drop down box. This is very useful if you have multiple investment accounts, you've connected all of your 401ks, your IRAs, your taxable accounts, and you want to drill down and look at just one account. So we can do that. I'm going to unselect them all and then just select his portfolio. And there it is. So now we're looking at the asset allocation based on just his portfolio. We can see um, here in table form that he has uh, a little bit in cash, and that's primarily probably from the bond fund. We can actually uh, drill down into these, which we'll do in just a second. He has a little bit of international bond exposure and then mostly U.S. bonds. So this, these three roughly add up to his 10%. We can see he's got 15% in international stocks, uh, just under 63% in U.S. stocks, and then this, this pesky little thing here called alternatives. And we'll look at these. The nice thing about personal capital is we can drill down into all of these, either by clicking on any of these rows or by going to the chart and, and clicking through. You can see as I, as I roll over any one of these asset classes, you can see extra lines and boxes that show up. And these represent uh, different funds in his portfolio that, that account for this asset class. So enough chit chat as I like to say, let's click on one of these, we'll do US stocks. So what this does is it breaks it down further, large cap value, core and growth, mid value, core and growth, and small cap value, core and growth. Core is the same thing as blend. Uh, blend is the term that say Morningstar uses, it's the same thing. We can then drill down further and it will actually show us the funds that make up, in this case, large cap core. You can see that right here. So VTI is most of it. That makes sense since it's 50% of its portfolio. The Schwab fund makes up uh, about 5%. And then there's some smaller allocations from the international fund and, and the REIT. So that's the large cap core. We could do the same thing on all of these. We could go to mid cap core. Again, it's going to be primarily VTI, but also some Schwab. And we could do that for all of the US stocks. What about alternatives? What does that mean? I'm pretty confident this is going to be primarily his REIT. Yeah, real estate. And so if we click on that, we can see, yeah, VNQ uh, makes, makes up for most of it. So this is a great way to really get uh, uh, a either a high level view of asset allocation, or as you can see, drilling down you know, into uh, the, the details. In fact, we can look at this little sliver on the right, it says municipal. So he has some muni bond in there, but not very much. Um, and uh, so when we pull back out and look at a high level, I think this is a perfectly reasonable uh, uh, asset allocation. The interesting question for me is, does he really need the Schwab fund? And what does that add to um, the portfolio as a whole. Um, generally, what it will do is um, skew the, the, the portfolio a little bit towards value than it otherwise would be. So for example, if he took the money in the, in the Schwab account and moved it into VTI, it, um, it, would, it would move the overall allocation a little bit further towards growth, still be in the blend category. Uh, it would probably lower his dividends a little bit. Again, he's only got 15% allocated to SC8 to, to the Schwab fund, but it has a higher dividend yield. Um, so does it, the question becomes, does it make sense to do what he's done and, and, and sort of tilt the portfolio a little bit towards value? And the, generally, I think it's perfectly fine. Many people will tell you it's actually a good thing, that you should um, while you have a blend fund like VTI, you should uh, tilt the, the large cap a little bit towards value and maybe even add a small cap value fund. I know my good friend Paul Merriman, uh, many of you might, might follow him. I know that he's a big advocate of doing that. My own personal view is um, uh, it pro you know, there's no way to know long term if tilting your portfolio to value is actually going to outperform. We know over the last decade, growth has crushed value, but that changes. And there will be decades when value crushes a growth. What I do in my own portfolio is tend to tilt it towards value, not through the mutual funds and ETFs that I own, but through the individual stocks that I own. 
uh, and that's a whole other video. But um, I certainly don't think it's a mistake to tilt your portfolio towards value. One of the interesting things about that in his case, if we look at U.S. stocks, even though he's tilted it towards value with the Schwab fund, he actually still has more growth than value, right? So the portfolio as a whole is actually tilted towards growth. Now, it would be tilted even more towards growth, I think, if he sold the Schwab account and put it in VTI. But you can see as it stands, he's got 12.92% in large cap growth, 10.96% uh, in large cap value. Now, that being said, when you go to the mid cap section, you can see it is very significantly tilted towards value. 7% of mid caps are, are, are tilted towards value versus we come over here, 2.32% uh, tilted towards growth. Uh, you know, at the end of the day, I think it's a perfectly reasonable uh, portfolio. Certainly not the only approach, but um, I, I certainly uh, can't fault it uh, in, in any way. Now, let's go to fees. To do that, we're simply going to go to planning, retirement fee analyzer. And here we have to make sure we've got the right accounts. We don't want this one. We just want to look at his uh, portfolio and we can see, yeah, I mean, the fees are rock bottom. Um, the nice thing about this, by the way, is you could make changes to these assumptions. So uh, let's assume we're going to contribute, we'll say $5,000 a year to this fund. Um, we'll say it's an IRA, so there's no employer match. Uh, we'll keep the growth at 7.5%. What this will do is show you over a time period, starts at age 41 in this case, we can edit all of those assumptions here, change the birth date, change the retirement age. Um, but it assumes, you know, we're 41, we're gonna retire at 65, and um, here will be total contributions, uh, total earnings, and the fees. And the nice thing I like about this is it, just do it doesn't just tell you your expense ratio for each fund, which you can see down here, and the overall expense ratio, which you see up here, it shows you how that's going to translate uh, into eff effectively lost growth. 68,000, you might look at that number and think, holy cow, that's insane. Well, imagine if his expense ratio were, were higher, like you, you were paying someone 1% to manage your, your investment portfolio. We can actually model that down here with the additional investment fees. Let's jack this up to, I don't know, 1%. <laughs> yeah, the numbers get ugly. Um, one percent is a huge, huge number when it comes to investment fees, and when you lose that compounding over, in this case, a twenty-five year time period, the numbers just get crazy. If we make this a four hundred one k, right, and we have some employer contributions, I'll just throw in there. I don't know, three grand. Uh, the total fee numbers get worse. And let's imagine the financial advisor you hire that charges 1% doesn't put you in the low-cost ETFs that ISIC was, was invested in, but puts you in uh, expensive mutual funds that cost another uh, percent. And yes, I've seen this a lot. I mean, it just, it, it really gets to a point where uh, it has a generational effect on your wealth. And you think about this in terms of retirement and the 4% rule. How in the world do you ever use the 4% rule when you're paying, in this hypothetical, 2% in fees, 1% to your advisor, and 1% to the stupid mutual funds he or she's put you in? <laughs> uh, the 4% rule just doesn't work. Remember, the 4% rule doesn't assume any fees. Uh, that might be fine if you have a smart portfolio like this one, where the total expense is just five basis points but hire an expensive financial advisor who puts you in expensive mutual funds and the 4% rule is just simply not workable. All right, I'm gonna get off my soapbox now. So that's the deal. Overall, I think his portfolio is, is a sound one. Uh, I certainly um, couldn't fault it for any reason. I think the 90-10 allocation is reasonable. He's using low cost uh, uh, index ETS. I think that's smart. He's tilted his large cap a little bit towards value and dividends in the Schwab fund. Uh, I don't know that that's necessarily a choice I would make, but uh, I, I certainly think it's a reasonable uh, choice. So there you go. Like I said at the beginning of the video, would be happy to evaluate your portfolio. 
just leave in the comments below. Again, don't put any personal information in this, just tickers, uh, percentages, and whether this is an taxable or retirement fund. I don't know how many I'm going to get, but um, I certainly will uh, do more of these videos in the future. If you have any questions, leave them in the comments below. I'd be happy to help you out any way I can. And until next time, remember, the best thing money can buy, apart from a, a low-fee, uh, well-diversified portfolio, the best thing money can buy is financial freedom.